We'll go ahead and get started. Um, let's turn to Acts the second chapter for a moment. Acts the second chapter. And what I want us to talk about here briefly is I want to talk about uh, how knowing Genesis 1 and believing in Genesis 1 can actually be indirectly a salvation issue. Now, last Sunday we talked about that it is important to understand Genesis, the first chapter, because uh, there are many Christians who they believe John 3.16, but they don't believe in Genesis 1, the six-day creation, for instance. Interesting. They believe in evolution of millions of years or whatever. They don't believe in the literal uh, six days, uh, 24-hour day creation, all right? I'm just going to crack this a little bit just for the sake of the noise, okay? All right? <clears throat> but God is very clear in his word in Genesis 1 um, how everything was created in six uh, literal 24-hour days. All right? And, but oftentimes uh, Christians will compromise that for the sake of, of science or as the scriptures in the New Testament may say, science falsely so-called. And so sometimes there is a challenge to God's authority. We have to recall that Genesis 1 is just as much Holy Ghost inspired as John 3.16, all right? And so that all scripture given by inspiration of, of God is profitable for doctrine and reproof and instruction in righteousness. Amen. Y'all doing all right? Amen. All right. Acts the second chapter. Acts the second chapter. So we've talked about the authority of God's word. What we're going to do now is talk about how God's word can indirectly affect our ability to deliver a salvation message, okay, and, and, and how important Genesis 1 is to us. So we're just going to start in the, the book of Acts, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, if you're in the New Testament, and we're going to start, amen, please. <laughs> 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 All right. It worked. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So, Acts the second chapter. Boy, talking about derailing a Sunday school class. Okay. We're trying to get focused. We're trying. We're, we're focusing. Focus. 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 Don't 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 focus over there. Your 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 vision across, but focus over here. Okay. Okay. Very good. Acts the second chapter. We're gonna just give a little background here. Uh, we're going to start off talking about Peter. We all know who Peter was, the apostle Peter who, who walked with the Lord, right? right? Peter, in this second chapter, is going to give a sermon, and as a result of giving this sermon, 3,000 people are going to be saved. All right? So after the second chapter, I'm just going to hit the highlights. I'm not going to read through it all, all right? But <clears throat> if you look down uh, at, um, let's start around... Um, Acts the second chapter around the 16th verse, Peter is speaking to all of these men that have come into the city for this holiday called Pentecost, all right? And so they're in this town, and Peter and the other disciples are, are prophesying, and they're preaching the gospel. And here's what Peter says in verse 16. He, he mentions, he talks about, but this is, is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So Peter starts talking about the prophet Joel, all right, and then later on, if you look at verse 22 of Acts, the second chapter, he talks about Jesus. He says, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as yourselves also know. So then he talks about Jesus for a little while. Look in verse 25. He says, for David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. And then ultimately, if you look at verse 41, he talks about Joel, he talks about uh, uh, Jesus, he talks about uh, David. Verse 41, look what happens after he preaches ab ab about these men. He says, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and that same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So, <clears throat> there are about 3,000 people who first believe, okay, because baptism has nothing to do with salvation. That is just an act of obedience you do after you believe, after you, you get saved. They first believe, 
And then they, were, they received his word. That means that they believed. And then they were baptized. And they were added to the church. 3,000. All right? Now, these men, they were... Um, well, let me back up here. Look at verse 5 of Acts chapter 2. Verse 5 of Acts chapter 2. These men that, that Peter and the disciples preached to, it says... And there, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, what type of men? Devout. Devout out of every nation under every heaven. So you had all these men come from various countries that came to this one spot in Jerusalem for the, the holiday celebration called, called Pentecost. All right? Now, it said that they were what kind of men? Devout men, which meant that they were very uh, forthright men, very, if I could use the word, righteous men. But wait a minute, you say that if they were devout men and righteous, well, they didn't get saved to verse 41. Why is that? Because they didn't believe. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says that we're not saved by our... Works. Works. Right? But by the great grace through faith, correct? So you can be righteous, you can be devout, and still be bound to hell. Are you, y'all see where I'm going with this? Okay, these were devout men, but they were on their way to hell. But by verse 41, after they heard the gospel of Jesus, they got saved. Are y'all with me? Because the Bible calls them devout. I'm not calling them devout. The Bible says they were devout. So they were righteous men even before they received the word. But they received the word, they believed it, and they got saved. All right, so y'all with me on that so far? But here's another thing that we don't want to miss in verse 5. When Peter was talking to these guys, what kind of people were they? According to verse 5. They were Jews. You see where it says? It says Jews, devout men. Y'all see that? So these were men who were already familiar with the, the prophecy of the Messiah. They were familiar with the laws of Moses and all of that. So they were already doing everything that the Old Testament commanded them to do. That was one of the reasons that they had traveled from whatever faraway country they were in. And they came to Jerusalem as part of the the celebration of Pentecost, they were being obedient to the traditions and the holidays and things of that nature, all right? So Peter was addressing uh, a lot of Jews here, right? And because he was addressing a lot of Jews, he was able to talk about Joel and Jesus and David, and the Jewish people knew what he was talking about, and they got saved, all right? Okay, you say, so far, so good, okay? So, so we're okay with that? Yeah. Okay, let's go to Acts, the 17th chapter, because I'm going somewhere with this. Acts, the 17th chapter, we're dealing with another preacher called Paul. And I want to pick up around um, the 17th verse, no, the 16th verse. Acts 17, 16. Acts 17, 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts 17, 16. This is the Apostle Paul. He had already preached in a couple of other different places. Now he is in this city of Athens. He's like smack dab in the middle of the capital of Greece. All right, where there is a lot of mythology, Greek mythology. They worship all of these mythological gods like Zeus and Hercules and Mercury and Diana and Athena and all of these, these, uh, you know, these Greek gods. Okay, so there's a lot of idolatry in this town, and Paul is in this town. He's going. He's there for a mission trip, but he's waiting on two of his soul winning partners to join him. Those being uh, Silas and Timothy. But they're in another town. They haven't arrived. So Paul's there by himself waiting on these other guys to come. But let's see what Paul does while he's here. Acts 17, 16. Are we there? Yes. It says, and while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him. <clears throat> Excuse me. When he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Okay, now what did he see? Well, at that time, of course, he saw all these statues of Zeus and statues of Hercules, and these people were worshiping all of these Greek gods, all right? And he saw that the entire city was given over to idolatry. And, um, and we know one of, um, um, the first commandment of God is, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the second commandment of God, that thou shalt not make any what? Graven images. Graven images, which would be like statues and things of that that look like men, anything above the earth, in the earth, or underneath the earth. That's what the Exodus 20 tells us. 
it says that you're not to make a, a statue or an image or a graven image of any creature that God has created. This is why in modern day uh, Israel today, you will find very little statues in the entire country of Israel. There are some there, but they were brought there by other people who are not Jewish because the Jews are still holding to God's commandment, which says there should be no graven images. So you're not going to see a bunch of statues of Moses, statues of prophets, because they were forbidden by the second commandment not to make any graven images of anything in the heaven. That includes birds. Anything in the earth includes the beasts of the fields. Anything under the earth and in the sea, which includes fish. Don't make any graven images. All right? But that's another Bible study for another day. But let's, let's get back here and see what, what Paul's doing here when he sees all this stuff. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons. We've seen that word devout before. So you can be devout and still be lost, right? Okay? And in the market daily with them that met with him. Verse 18. The cer- then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. Now, the Epicureans and the Stoics actually had different beliefs. Neither, either, both beliefs were wrong. Uh, neither one of them believed in the true and living God. But they both had different types of beliefs where the Epicureans didn't like the Stoics and the Stoics didn't like the Epicureans. All right? But isn't it amazing that when it comes to a child of God who's going out trying to give the gospel, that people who don't even like each other will come together when it comes to going against someone who's standing for Christ? Isn't that amazing how that works out? As a matter of fact, you don't have to turn there, but you can make a bookmark. I think it's Luke, the 23rd chapter in the 12th verse. It talks about how Pontius Pilate and King Herod used to hate each other, but they came together when it came to the crucifixion of Jesus, that they were friends, uh, they became friends after uh, they decided that Jesus was to be crucified. But Pontius Pilate and Herod, and Herod, the King Herod, they didn't even like each other. All right? So it's funny how people will come together who don't like each other, but they'll come together when it comes to going against uh, Christ and, or God's children. All right? Just a side note there. So there are certain philosophers in the Epicureans and the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. All right? Yes. Acts 17, verse 18. Acts 17, verse 18. Acts 17, verse 18. I thought he came from some other country there for a minute. Well, well you, you know, you, you have, all, you, you have uh, these people who profess themselves to be wise, but they're fools, according to Romans 1. You, you always have people who think that they're smarter than everybody else. And so they have their nose in the air, and they, they think they know everything. And I can imagine that these people, of course, they're speaking ancient Greek, which I don't know. So I have to use some other type of hotsy totsy language, which is English. And, 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 and they're saying, what is this babbler? They're calling him a babbler. They're not really listening to what he's telling them, that he's trying to preach Jesus and the resurrection to them. He says, what does this babbler know? You see, they're so smart. Have you ever met someone like that? Thinks they're so smart and they're just, oh, blah, blah. You're just a babbler. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm smarter than everybody, you know? And, and so this is the attitude of these people because he was preaching unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Acts, the 17th chapter Verse 19. And it reads, And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would therefore, uh, we, we would know therefore what these things mean. Verse 21. For all the Athenians and strangers which were they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. There are some people, they just want to be, they just want to have the, the newest stuff. I want the newest gadgets. I want to hear the latest news. I want to be the first person to be able to tell somebody something new. New diet. All right. <laughs> new diet. <laughs> I want a keto diet. Yeah, okay, okay. But these are the kind of people who just wanted to hear something new. And they had never heard... 
this type of preaching before. They had never heard about Jesus and Jesus being re- uh, resurrected from the dead and having power over the resurrection. So this is tickling their ears. They're like, oh, this is some strange new God. We need to hear more about this stuff, right? Are you with me so far? I'm, I'm going somewhere. That we're going to tie this into the creation here in just a, a minute. Okay, verse number 22. It says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Verse 23, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. So these guys are so crazy into, into worshiping all of these different gods, Zeus, Hercules, Pericles, all these different gods, that, they, that something in them told them, well, you know what, we may have missed somebody. So let's set up this monument to the unknown god. So he'll be our catch-all god if we miss any, any other gods. We'll set up a monument to this unknown God. And so Paul's looking around. He said, man, so y'all, are, y'all are so superstitious. You got all these idol gods set up here. You even got one set up to an unknown God whom you ignorantly worship. Yes, go ahead, sir. I think it's interesting that he's been a little confrontational for more than a little uh-huh. on Mars Hill, uh-huh. which Mars is the war god. Yes, yes, yes. Mars is the, is the god of war. And also he's in a place called Areopagus. Aries, it comes from the, the Roman, you could have uh, Mars is the Roman way of saying the god of war, and I think Aries is the Greek way of saying it. So Areopagus, the, the Pagus is sort of, uh, that's Greek for uh, a rock or a mountain or hill or something of that nature. So Areopagus actually means Mars hill, but it just means it in, in Greek versus Roman because the Roman word for Mars, the god of war, is, is Mars, if you want to say the Greek is Aries. So, yeah. But, um, yeah, so the, that, that's, that's, that's uh, pretty interesting uh, there. Um, and another thing, too, this is a side note, I'm getting sidetracked here, but in 1820, some archaeologists actually found a monument that was to the unknown God. They don't know if it's the same one that the scripture's speaking of. But the the archaeologists in 1820, they actually found a monument that says to the unknown God. And it was found in the same vicinity that we're talking about here with Paul. So we don't know if it's the same one or not. But once again, it it goes to show you that the Bible proves everything else. And not everything else proves the Bible. All right? Okay. But uh, going back here, it says that um, uh, Paul is saying, hey, you're worshiping this uh, unknown God whom ye ignorantly worship." You're, you, you know that there's a God out there, but you call him the unknown God. You don't know who you're worshiping. You don't know how you should be worshiping him. And so Paul has already tried to preach to them Jesus and the resurrection. Watch what Paul does in this very next verse. Verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that They should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far away, every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And uh, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are uh, are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art or man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. 
Looking at this last part, it says, Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that whom he hath ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, and that he has raised him from the dead. Who is Paul talking about? Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. Okay. Now you're saying, okay, so what does that have to do with anything? Paul starts his sermon off at verse 24 saying, God that did what? Made the world. Creation. We're going to creation here. Hmm. That sounds a lot like Genesis 1. Are y'all catching what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, let's read a little further. Let's go to uh, verse 32 here, and then I'll bring this home. Verse 32, it says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, others said, We will hear this uh, again of this matter. And so Paul departed among them, verse 34, How be it certain men clave unto him, and believe among those which was Dionysius, uh, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So, Paul goes, brings, you know, talks about Jesus and the resurrection, and you're normally going to get one of three different responses when you go knocking on doors, you know, inviting people to church, telling them about Jesus. You're going to get people who are going to mock you, you saw that right here. It says, uh, some mock. And when he heard, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, it says what? Some mock. Others said, we will hear this matter of again. Uh, uh, of again. So what does that mean? That means you knock on the door, you say, hey, you know, I would like to invite you to church, share the, the good word with you, share the gospel with you. Oh, I don't really have time, but... Uh, you know, you give them a gospel tract. They said, okay, well, I'll think about it. So we'll, we'll talk about this sometime later. Those are that people. Okay. And then in verse 34, you have people who actually receive the word and they believe and they get saved. So those are generally the three different types of reactions you get when you're sharing the word of God with others. Okay. But what I want to point out here, and then even when the people that got saved, it was a certain, it was a few of them. But what I want to point out here is this. Paul tried to preach to them Jesus and the resurrection before, and they called him a babbler. And then he said, well, y'all are worshiping an unknown God, so let me back this thing up and start from the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then he started from creation, and he, what did he do? He brought it all the way back to Jesus. Oh, wait a minute, now some people got saved. Did y'all catch that? Okay, because I, I, I tell you what, when I first moved to Dallas, Dallas, it's, when I first moved to Dallas here over 20 years, 20 something years ago, I had never knowingly met anyone who didn't know who God was. I guess I just grew up in a sheltered community. Even people who didn't go to church back in my hometown, they knew who God was, they knew who Jesus was, whether they attended church or not. Pretty much you could just go to a gas station and say, Praise the Lord for nice weather. Oh, yeah, God's good. Amen. All right, you can do that back in my hometown, or at least you, you used to be able to do it. Okay, I came out here to Dallas. There are people who have no clue who Jesus is, and it blew my mind. I was like, You don't know who Jesus is? Okay, these people had no idea who God was. Okay, so Paul could not reach these people the same way Peter reached the people in Acts, the second chapter. The people in Acts, the second chapter, had a foundation. They had a base. They were Jews. They were devout men. They knew about in the beginning God. They knew about the prophet Joel. They knew about Moses. They knew about King David. So all uh, Peter had to do was bring it on home to Jesus and tell him about Jesus. 3,000 got saved. Now, was Paul a failure here because it says only a certain few got saved? He had to have been a failure, right? He didn't get 3,000 saved. Doesn't the world judge you by just the success of a church by the number of its members? Oh, you only got 40 members? Ah, According to God, Paul was just as successful as Peter because there are those that got saved. But they didn't get saved the same way that the people that Peter preached to got saved. Paul had to start from the beginning, from the foundation. This is why it's important for us to know Genesis 1, because you're going to run into people who have no foundation. And if you just walk up to somebody who doesn't know God and say, trust in Jesus. Well, even along that line, if I may interject, 
the lady that's on the prayer list, Bobby Goodman, that's my friend that's Jewish, that I'm trying to win over to the Lord. I took her back to Genesis, and she's Jewish too, and she's been in her whole life. Mm -hmm. She did not know about original sin. I took her right back to Genesis. I said, mm -hmm. you have to have a savior, Bobby. Yes. We have fallen. You fell. Your, your Jewish people, the Old Testament people, fell. And they can't get up without a savior. And so she was like, hmm, I've never heard that. See, and she was Jewish. And yes, yes, and the point is, is that a lot of times when there are some people, most of the time when I try to lead someone to the Lord, I take them down the Romans road, right? Because I make certain assumptions that they know something about God, that they know something about Jesus, and I take them down the you know Romans road, so, you know, for all of sin and falling short of the glory of God. But uh, uh, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, and then I tell you know share with them the the good news about. Uh, 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 for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the Romans road, okay? But you can't do that with everybody. When you're leading someone to the Lord, depending on where they're at, you may have to use a different tactic. You may have to give them a personal testimony. You may have to tell them John 3.16. There was a young man out here, this was years ago, uh, we led him to the Lord right out here in the foyer. I didn't take him down the Romans road. I used the book of John to lead him to the Lord. I had to take it from a different angle. All right? So what may work for Peter may not necessarily work for Paul. But the goal is still the same, is to preach gospel and get people saved. All right? Now, Paul started out with Jesus and the resurrection back in... Uh, Verse 17 and 18, okay, but guess what? He lost a lot of people. He says, you're a babbler. What are you talking about? So then when they took him to Mars Hill, Paul said, okay, 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 let me back this up because y'all are worshiping an unknown God. Y'all don't even know who you're worshiping. You didn't know what the text says? They're worshiping an unknown God. They didn't even know who they were worshiping. Paul said, well, you don't even know who you're worshiping, so let me start at Genesis 1 and take you to Jesus. Peter didn't have to do that because they were already at a certain level of understanding of the Old Testament. These Greeks and Athenians and all that, they were clueless. They didn't know. Are y'all with me? Yeah. But even as a result of that, by way of the Holy Spirit, there were still many who were one. Not necessarily 3,000, but there were still many who came to Jesus because... Paul had a knowledge of Genesis 1. Do we see how important Genesis 1 is and how it can affect uh, how we can lead someone to the Lord? How it can have an indirect effect upon the salvation of people that we talk to. Did this, does that make sense to you now? Okay. Uh, we're going to have to dismiss. Any questions or comments? No, sir. All right. Uh, Uh, the last verse of Acts 17, it said, How be it certain men clave unto him and believe, among which were Dionys uh, Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others. So at least four people got saved. Because others, others is more than one. So it could have been a lot. It could have been a hundred. It doesn't give a number. But uh, one other thing, and, and this is a side note, Di uh, Dionysius is actually the name of a Greek god. He's also known as uh, Bacchus in Rome. He's the god of wine, god of fertility, god of debauchery. But another thing that this Greek god, this, this mythological god is known for, he's known to have, in, in, the, in the mythology, he's a god who died and rose from the dead. So it's pretty interesting that a guy named Dionysius, who was named after that god, he was named after a god, that a fake God that died and rose from the dead, he's actually saved by the word of the real God who died and rose from the dead. Amen? So I don't think that's a coincidence that they give us the name of that particular individual uh, because he's actually named after a, a fake resurrection God, deity, whatever. Okay? All right, any other questions or comments? Now, I know we had wanted to uh, get into... Uh, Job 41, but I, I wanted to give some more context around why Genesis 1 is so important and is such a foundation upon which it can even be um, an effective soul winning tool. All right? It's not something just for general head knowledge. Genesis 1 can actually be used as a soul winning tool. 
just as Paul used it here. Okay, so it's very important to, to know that. What we'll do, Lord willing, for next time, um, next Sunday, we'll pick up with Job 41 again and uh, talk about um, another creature um, in Scripture uh, that was created on the same day that Adam was created. We know the beasts of the field and man were created on the same day, which is the sixth day. And so in Job 41, we'll pick up and continue to talk about that next time. All right. So any other questions or comments before we dismiss?